Good afternoon. My name is Peter Wooding and welcome to Automotive EV. Uh, in this session, we're going to talk about the significant growth in EV battery pack demand. And our expert panel are going to discuss the associated opportunities and challenges. I will introduce uh, all of the three, all of the uh, speakers, and then um, lead immediately into uh, Jackie Murray, who's uh, delivering our first presentation. So thank you, Jackie, Stephen, and Akim. And uh, I will hand over to you now, Jackie. Thank you. Thanks. So um, I'm Jackie Murray for the last um, three years, as Steve uh, well knows. Uh, I've been running um, the what's called the Faraday Battery Challenge. So if you want to flip onto the next start, a slide for me, Sean. So really, this came around in 2016. Um, uh, this graph sort of describes why. It came about because the automotive industry and government in the UK worked out that there was going to become uh, a real cliff edge in terms of emission targets. The blue line is the average fleet emission for passenger cars um, in the EU. So you can see just a very high level how uh, technology has developed since 2000, or well, year 2000 before regulation and 2008 since regulation came in per kilometre driven for your average performance of your entire fleet. And what happened was initially a lot of uh, research went into internal combustion engines and actually we got a very good performance um, and you can see that drive down. What you're seeing in the last few years is the impact of things like real life um, testing cycles as a result of Dieselgate. What you're seeing is a real trend for SUVs. So we, we all seem to be want to drive an SUV at the moment. Um, and you're seeing um, just really the fact we're hitting the limits of the internal combustion engine um, uh, technology. And actually that drive down has got very little to do with things like hybrid technologies, for example. And what you can see is actually now in 2020, um, the data is a little bit behind because of the way they record it. But now in 2020, we're having to make decisions for 2030 and the automotive industry in particular, um, payback on, on the architectures and the platforms that they use, that uh, doesn't come until year seven or eight. Um, and so therefore right here, right now, you need to be choosing your propulsion systems that are going to hit you an av fleet average of 67 grams per kilometer driven. I think the best in class at the moment for uh, an internal combustion engine will be the, th be the Toyota Yaris. And I think that manages about 75 grams um, per kilometer driven. So you can see right here, right now, um, we've got an issue. And that was realized back in the Auto Council in 2016. So Sean, if you just flip forward one for me. Uh, so what we started to do as a bunch of engineers and as an industry, we sort of started realizing that uh, we needed to understand what the change was going to be, this electrification game. And I think we're gonna to touch on this in, this, in, the, in the discussions. Um, and just for the UK, we could see that actually in Sunderland and Nissan, um, the Nissan Leaf Battery Factory and AESC, uh, we have about two gigawatts in the UK at the moment uh, being manufactured. But actually by 2035, you can see that's up to about 100 gigawatt hours. Um, and it's, it's about an eight billion pound industry by 2035. And that's just in the UK and that's just for passenger cars. Um, so what happened was we designed something called the Faraday Battery Challenge. If you flip forward, I'll keep this nice and short. So really it's based on three pillars. So we have um, uh, a Faraday institution that does early stage research. Um, it's uh, over a hundred million pounds worth of funding now going into uh, 22 different academic institutions across the UK. Um, they work actually with industry. So this has got a really applied uh, research sort of take. Um, and actually it's got nine major programs underway looking at everything from next gen uh, batteries and solid state and sodium ion and lithium sulfur to uh, multi-scale modeling. We have um, a large collaborative R&D cohort. Uh, we've sponsored, uh, we will be sponsoring by the end of this year over a hundred, uh, over 90 million pounds worth of projects. Um, uh, currently that sounds at about 129 different organizations working together in 64 projects. And you can look up more of this online if you want to see who's doing what and what those projects really look like. 
Uh, and then finally, I've just come from a meeting actually with them. Um, we have the UK Battery Industrialisation Centre that is due to open this year, and that's over £120 million pounds worth of funding. So we have, as you can see, um, a huge ecosystem. The BIC is actually, as I say, the Battery Industrialisation Centre, the BIC as we call it, uh, is a real interesting piece of this puzzle. Um, it allows you to um, take the prototypes um, that you've designed and manufacture them at full manufacturing rate. This op offers opportunities for uh, automotive OEMs and battery OEMs to work together, for example, or for niche vehicles or for uh, people like, um, I guess, I don't know, a rail company and a small company up in Sunderland potentially to work together to take uh, to, to manufacture pre-series, i.e. sort of um, larger than prototype, but pre-series uh, batteries for um, rail or trains or marine or whatever it might be. And it's an open access uh, centre. It doesn't hold IP and you can work commercially and confidentially in it. So that's the quick introduction for me. I hope I haven't taken longer than five minutes. Thank you, Jackie. Um, we'll now hand over to you, Stephen. Sure, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I've just got a, a couple of slides very briefly uh, speak to and then and then we'll have a have a, a conversation, I think. So I'm Stephen Irish. I started Hyperdrive uh, just over eight years ago. Uh, and now look after the, the commercial aspects of what we do so engaging with new customers and looking at technology roadmap and also where the trends are in the industry um so we're based up in the northeast we're co-located with the ascc cell uh manufacturing so not by accident so we use that that cell in a number of applications in our own battery packs um we the slides are already slightly out of date we're over 50 employees uh and we have our R&D and uh, product manufacturer on site. So we take the, the best uh, battery cells that we can find and we engineer the battery packs, critically the BMS uh, and all the associated components in the pack and then help our customers integrate them into the end product. That's, that's kind of where our differentiator is. We've got the capacity to do up to 30,000 packs here. So we don't do that yet, but we, we have the uh, we have the capacity to do that. And we have a number of key markets. Uh, I think we'll touch on uh, some of them a little bit later. But for us, uh, electric vehicles are quite a broad church, if you like. We, we do off-highway material handling as well as some stationary applications. And more recently, we've announced our rail project, um, as Jackie alluded to earlier. Um, so we, we're very proud of our blue chip. Uh, customer base and we have a range of uh, standard products but also bespoke ones that we, that we manufacture for customers uh, so uh, that was just a little bit of an overview our manufacturing facilities are called hive uh, and uh, the picture there is actually out of date already because we, we've taken those lines out and put new ones in so we've got five stroke six lines that manufacture modular battery packs and I should really mention that that we've been the beneficiary of Innovate UK funding previously. So that's really helped us push on, helped us start the company in the first place, in fact. And then we did a large APC project, which enabled us to put the pilot lines in for the modular pack. And that's since evolved into uh, several more uh, production lines. So that's just a little bit of an overview and a taster of, of what Hyperdrive do before we get into the conversation. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we'll now sort of uh, shortly go over to Akim, who will really tell us why a, a global global start again global logistics provider is actually part of a battery session. But I think that will all come to light very, very quickly. Yes. Thank you, Peter, Jackie, Stephen. Thank you also for your introductions. I am Achim Glass. I'm the head of the Global Automotive and New Mobility Vertical at Kühnemagel, being stationed close to Zurich in Switzerland. The reason why Kühnemagel is joining this session is because 
we now heard about two facilities where actually you can go and assemble your batteries, you know, do prototype tests, um, and eventually you have to bring cells to the to the assembly plants, and you also then need to move the finished products, the battery packs around. And this is all what, what Kühnenagel is proud of doing. Um, Kühnenagel is a global logistics service provider, and uh, besides others, we have specialized a few years ago on the safe transportation and storage for lithium ion cell, lithium ion batteries. And uh, for that particular reason, I have the honor of joining the session here today to contribute with our experiences that we have gathered over the past years of working for battery manufacturing companies, uh, tier one suppliers, assembling modules and battery packs, and OEMs who are actually using the battery packs to build them into their vehicles or to actually then collect end of life battery packs and transport them to recycling. So my part of the session here today is to contribute when it comes to storage and to transportation, in particular, uh, clarifying a little bit the complexities around it. Thank you, Aki. Um, Jackie, could you provide us with the volume forecast for batteries? Um, <clears throat> what the expects to, sorry. Yep. So, okay, I can, I can take that away. Um, so I showed the UK projection um, on my slides, um, and I talked about 8 billion by 2035 for the UK. You know, when we started doing that, um, estimates were around the 50 billion for Europe. OK, so what we have there is a really big number and they're hockey stick type graphs. Um, I think actually what we also now need and what, what we've learned over the last few years is um, that's just for passenger cars. The, as you heard from Steve's across sector applications are just um, perhaps even faster to commercialize. So we're seeing a great pickup in in um, in other sectors. Um, and so that 50 billion started out with us being, well, let's take that with a pinch of salt. And I suspect now we'd be probably increasing those projections uh, further. Um, and the Faraday Institution, for those listening, do publish those sorts of um, detailed reports. So keep an eye on that web website if you want. Stephen, um, what has all this growth meant for you at Hyperdrive? And are there any opportunities that you could highlight? Sure, yeah. And, and as Jackie said, you know, we uh, the kind of cross sector opportunities for us uh, are our business is principally around non passenger car. Uh, we're, we're not excluded from it, which is kind of where uh, a lot of our opportunities have been. So uh, we, we've always had a kind of mainstay in robotics and automation, in um, principally in order fulfillment centers, and obviously rather uh, sort of co contrary to some of the trends uh, very recently uh, home deliveries obviously uh, increased and the demand for that uh, ha has gone up dramatically so we've we've seen that very strong through the the challenge of the last six months so our, our robotics uh, demand is, is increased um, and we recently did a report on the uh, future of the construction industry so the other kind of key area for us in off highway so working with customers such as JCB, uh, where we've supported the electrification of um, uh, three products that they've launched to market. Um, so we can see there uh, uh, the, the, the trends in um, construction and off-highway where the demand for uh, elimination of uh, uh, fossil fuels, burning fossil fuels and displacement of diesel in particular has been really high on people's agenda. Um, and what shifted over time is obviously there's the interest in the, the global impact on reduction in CO2 and emissions, but but also the local impact. So in, uh, in particular, diesels and, and the effect on individuals' health. So in, in built up areas, but also uh, for uh, people working on these sites. Um, and uh, and as Jackie mentioned as well, the, 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 the rail side of things. So for us, we've recently announced uh, uh, a development uh, project we've been doing with uh, Hitachi Rail in the UK and it's a fantastic example of the UK companies working together in a UK-based supply chain so um, we, we've been uh, working in development of uh, a, a purely battery-powered train which has been in the press recently so we're very proud of that so yeah let's sort of left and right of field not not clearly not automotive not passenger car but still uh, uh, the underlying technologies are, are common, so we, we see we see huge opportunity for us. 
Thank you. As a, as a logistics provider, and given the uh, the volume that, that's been discussed, how sort of capable are logistics in fulfilling their important mm -hmm. part of this? Mm -hmm. You know, Peter, um, it is not really the question of, uh, it is super important, you need to move these batteries around. And we all know that lithium ion batteries are dangerous goods. Uh, if you don't transport them according to legislations uh, due to impact, uh, bad weather conditions, etc., there's always a risk of spontaneous combust, meaning explosion and fire, and uh, life is at risk when storing and transporting the batteries. So um, in the past, the question was not um, how much does it cost to move a battery from across the ocean, but it was rather, can you move the batteries? Do you have the capacity and the capability to move these batteries around? And unfortunately, I have to say, uh, according to the different mode of transportation, so rail transportation uh, or, or international sea freight across continents, different modes of transport imply different dangerous goods regulations. And that is what makes it super, super complicated in order to move these batteries around. And this is again where the expertise um, from, from me and my team, we have approximately 150 people in 37 uh, lithium ion battery hotspots in the world, predominantly Asia, Europe, and North America, comes into play. So in the past, uh, people asked not how much does it cost, but can you do it? And only now, a few years in the business, we see high take up on electric vehicles. Now we see that it is possible to generate some slight economies of scale. But still, many OEMs actually postponed the launch of their uh, vehicle sale because their supply chain for the lithium battery production was interrupted. So there's a high volatility, and we all know the lithium battery is the most expensive product of an electric vehicle. So there's a big focus now on improving the supply chain performance um, of EVs. So Peter, maybe I could jump in. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just pulling up a, a slide actually to remind me of the numbers. So excuse me if I'm looking left field. So if you make an assumption about those demand forecasts that you're going to source it from Asia, um, and you're going to need a certain amount of volume to, to hit those that 50 billion. Um, by 2035, you're going to be looking at about 1.7 million vehicles in transit. Um, and that's six weeks shipping by sea. And you're talking at somewhere, somewhere like 6.35 billion pounds a year that will be in transit. So we are seeing trends, I think. And I think um, Kunanaga will probably back this up in terms of people looking to put this, the, the manufacturing facilities closer to the automotive or the vehicle manufacturers. So you're starting to see shifts. And that's why you're seeing things like Tesla in the press, looking at battery factory location in Europe, um, LG Chem, Samsung, others that are, that are locating here too. Mm -hmm. I think, Jackie, we have to differentiate between uh, the manufacturing of the EV battery pack. Mm -hmm. um, to do the manufacturing, yes, we can do that in Europe but still they need, you need to sell production. And yeah. yes, it leads to sell manufacturing sites are now, I don't want to say they are mushrooming across Europe, but there have been multiple announcements. Uh, but um, when we look at the number of gigafactories around the world, um, the demand from European and North American car makers is far greater than local supply of lithium cells. So therefore we as an organization uh, continue to make significant investments into infrastructure, um, fire safety infrastructure, in order to, con to, to be able to service our customers by providing space and storage locations, in particular out of Asia, into Europe and North America. In North America. But um, Stephen, question to you. Now, we, we spoke about the, um, you know, the challenges uh, now when, when it comes to transportation. Where do you see the opportunities uh, which are coming by going into mass production? You know, because uh, units were very small. Um, now we see the hockey stick development. Um, what are some of the opportunities which we have now, uh, you as, as manufacturers and Kranagel as service provider? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, I think uh, obviously we, we've had uh, uh, our growth curve has kind of matched that that global demand increase that you see. Uh, so that that's been a challenge in itself. So 
as a small company that's grown very quickly, we've, we've um, seen a sort of annual average growth rate of 60 to 80 percent. We'll actually double this year and we expect to double next year as well. So that it comes with it, its challenges. And um, initially, um, you know, uh, manufacturing here in the UK, but it, exporting all over the world. So that, that has been a, a challenge. So we've got, you know, uh, customers uh, dispersed all over the all over the globe. And uh, we're, we're experts in design, manufacture and integration, not in logistics. So there, there's obviously there's opportunities to work with companies like yours where uh, you're right, the, the, the challenges and you can spend a lot of time. Uh, there's, there's a lot of legislation and changing changing requirements for different markets. So um, move, moving batteries around, you know, heavy, expensive commodities to move around. Um, we work very closely with our customers, though, to understand uh, their plans for the future. Uh, we, we've got some good uh, uh, modular uh, standard product or, or certainly, a, a, you know, a, a, the, the base architecture being standard, being developed in a way that can be um, transported as well. So it could be localized uh, in, in the way that Jackie alluded to there. So, so it may well be in future that we co-locate our pack assembly with some of our key customers abroad, but we'll always have a, a, a substantial footprint here in the UK. So really that gives us the best of both worlds, allowing us to support customers early on in their, in their projects where the volume might be quite small but we will work with them where there's a, an obvious strategic route to higher volumes. Uh, we'll, we'll align ourselves with them and work with them on, on what that strategy might look in future. So the aim mm-hmm. is to be flexible. We've obviously had to mitigate against uh, unknown trading conditions as far as tariffs and what have you go for import and export. So localizing, you know, onshoring has been to our advantage and short supply chains obviously mean lower cost and, um, Lower, lower embodied CO2, but also it turned out we're, we're very valuable when when the uh, pandemic hit. So having a nice short supply chains help there. But it, but obviously when we're looking at a global market, we, we need to be thinking about how we would align ourselves to our to our customers' uh, requirements in the future. Mm-hmm. Akim, I've got a question for you. Can I can I ask you a question? Oh, when, of I talk, you can. when I talk to all my companies, one of the things that they raise is is the cost of all those logistics, particularly on um, the end of life batteries as well, so the future costs and and how they account for that. Do you think there's an opportunity in logistics around, particularly the end of life logistics, we seem to be lacking infrastructure? Yes. You know, the good news is, I don't think it can become any more expensive than it is today. (laughs) Today, to move an end of life battery across Europe is cumbersome and very challenging. Um, we have to keep in mind that uh, the highest take-up rates of EVs we have in countries such as uh, in Norway, um, Germany, and France, and um, the manufacturing plants which accept lithium-ion battery packs are located uh, predominantly in France, Belgium, and Germany. Uh, so therefore, by moving end-of-life batteries across Europe, we have to go across border, which makes it complicated because an end-of-life battery means end of life, it goes to recycling. That means you have to transport these batteries according to waste regulation, which again requires different paperwork and different loopholes to jump through. So the bad news is that, for example, we can receive a phone call now any minute to collect um, an end of life battery in Norway and to bring it to recycling in, in, in Belgium. That means it will be a dedicated truck who will go all the way to Norway, collect the end of life battery, subject to specialized packaging, Mm -hmm. uh, meaning it's it's a safety transport box, which has a toxic toxic gas filter built in. Uh, If the the battery should explode, nothing will actually happen uh, to the vehicle and customers can rent these batteries, uh, these battery boxes from Kuhnemagel. And then this truck needs to go all the way back through several European countries until it arrives at the recycling point. So that is not efficient. That is not what we like to do because it's not making good use of resources. So the upside is that um, we, in the past, you received one battery to be collected in Norway, and we now see that per month, and now we see there's a 
higher take up rate. More and more cars are now coming to the end of life, in particular Asian cars who have been around for quite some time, which gives us the opportunity to consolidate. You, you, cannot, you cannot warehouse an end of life battery easily in any given warehouse. So we are building up mobile storage locations for these end of life batteries in the before mentioned countries, um, Germany, France, and then Scandinavia and Norway. And then when we have, have enough batteries together, then we dispatch a truck, and then we're gonna bring these batteries to recycling, which means we can easily reduce the transportation costs by several hundred percent, because I can put eight batteries on a truck compared to only one battery. Uh, and yes, on the other hand, there are some increased storage costs in origin, but they, they reduce transportation costs, easily compensate for the additional storage charges. The complexity is that, yes, we may have five batteries to be collected in Norway, but some of them have to go to recycler one, and others to recycler two, and again, others are going to recycler three. So we need to go into milk runs, okay? But the point I'm saying is with higher quantities running through our network, we will eventually be able to also achieve the first economies of scale but we are far away from optimization. And I, I refer to what I said earlier. Uh, it's when you fish around in the market for a transportation company, it's not how much of it cost. The question is, can you do it in a compliant way? I mean, that, so therefore, just com the comparison of that to the current dismantlers for internal combustion engine, uh, you know, that we have all over the UK, all over Europe, yeah, so that's a real challenge. So I, I assume companies like Guna Nagel are, are really looking at this. this you might have, must have a very significant part to play in this this moving forward. Well, well thank you for the flowers. <laughs> we, we launched the product in 2017, anticipating um, the, the requirements from the industry. And uh, yes, we as an organization have also been disappointed because the take-up rate hasn't been a take-up rate from consumers and OEMs alike hasn't been at the pace as we wanted it to see. But regardless, okay, we are in here in the long run. Our organization is 127 years old and we're here to stay. So we see that this development is, is not taking place, which, which is awesome, which is very, very good. I guess so that's how not, sorry. Sorry, no, you go, Peter, sorry. I was just say, so, so how can you, you we change that? You know, is, is, is a vehicle manufacturer doing enough? Um, should we, because with the sound of all the movement and cost, we're, we're mm. aiming to a, a, a zero carbon vehicle. And, and people are assessing the, the, the sort of carbon footprint of, of whatever you want to call it, of a vehicle based on the tailpipe that's not really what it gives out and there isn't a tailpipe anymore. But how much should we, should we score a vehicle not only by what footprint it's giving out but by what it's taken to get to the car as well so we're, we're actually talking about reducing emissions globally and we're carrying monstrous amount of things all over and we're still saying the car only has this but it doesn't does it because it, it's had all the other so actually, I, I would come back on that because i was reading the the bmw mini e-mini versus the BMW mini life cycle assessment. So actually we do measure and compare solely from cradle to cradle. So okay. actually I think the people on the call uh, are well aware. Um, and that's a really good one to look up because it's only a very short one and it's a, it's a nice description and it shows you how much better in the entire lifetime, uh, including the recycling at the end, um, how much better the electric vehicles are and you can take another big chunk if you plug it into a renewables contract when you're charging it. So, so um, from our perspective in the industry, I think we know and are very clear on actually all those different elements. So recycling an internal combustion engine um, is, a, is, is a smaller activity than it is at the moment for EVs, and we will work to increase the efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. But internal combustion engines in their life, life cycle emit so much pollution from their tailpipes that it does counteract it. So I would recommend people go and read up on that. I'd also say, because I work with the European Battery Alliance and uh, I used to be an environmental regulator, um, actually they, the eco design labels, like your white goods, Peter, you know, mm. you have your A rating and your E rating and you buy the A++ or whatever it is now, or the A++. 
uh, I think the European regulators will very much move to enable consumers to make decisions on the efficiency of those vehicles. But I think the the chestnut that has been roasted, to use a British phrase already, is the efficiency of electric vehicles versus internal combustion. I think that is the science is very clear. But but I can I can also uh, confirm that when it comes to OEMs requesting lithium battery transport lithium battery cell transportation, um, there is a big. Um, there's a huge amount of, of, um, of focus on how much footprint does the transport now actually uh, produce. Globally around the world, logistics accounts to 7% of the global warming. So we as one of the leaders also have a certain responsibility. And therefore, we have now witnessed more and more the shift of moving lithium cells, which, which we used to fly a lot because you don't want to stop the, uh, the assembly line. So they are being flown, which is crazy. Uh, the majority travels per, per ship, but now also more and more we see take up rate by rail because rail is obviously still the greenest out of these three transport modes, uh, despite the, the challenges which they are moving. In fact, you cannot move cells on the rail in China due to dangerous goods, but there are other ways of how you can overcome that. So, so yes, we also see that uh, the the cradle to grave emissions scoring has become important. And it's not just a nice to have, but it has become a decision making criteria for many, many customers around the world. I expect to see more of that. I think you'll see that regulated very quickly. Uh, I'm sure, Steve, you have that as well when you're designing your vehicles, whatever they might be. Um, the concept of actually making sure they're the most efficient use of the power um, and energy that you've got in your battery. Yeah, I think it's a good point. It's it, obviously these things are, have an environmental impact and a local emissions and health impact, but they're, they're also better technologies. They are actually more efficient overall. And if you can demonstrate that, you can build up a business case quite quickly. Uh, you know, in many instances, if it, it's going to save on operating costs, it's going to increase uptime and it's going to reduce um, things like maintenance. So, yeah, it, it's looking at the overall picture of um, total life cycle but also within, it, within its operations, it has these nuances that, that, that improve um, imp improve the experience as well. So, so, so for example, the, the, the JCB excavator is very quiet, so the operators like it because you're not getting the vibration inputs, you're not getting the noise inputs, and you can actually hear what's going on. You can you can hear if you clank into a gas pipe or something like that. You you, you can hear it before you cut through it. Um, so, yeah, but it, it's really important to make sure there's a good, honest conversation around that total life cycle analysis. If it's uh, otherwise, we as a company, you know, we're an engineering company, a technology company and a manufacturing company. We would spend a lot of time doing some fun prototypes and, you know, one off demonstrators really have to see uh, the, the entire uh, business case stack up before we can really commit and, and push on. We can't forget, I guess, about internal combustion engine. Uh, production routes and, and things like the logistics associated with oil and gas uh, and their environmental impacts too. And, and I think it's easy to forget that. Yeah, and I'm not sure that's always fully priced in. I mean, you hear horror stories from historical kind of automotive supply chain of components being sent back and forth across Europe. And, you know, it, it, it is the embodied CO2 and energy really sort of priced in? Probably not always. So, yeah, yeah obviously it's got to run, run, run through. You know, so these cases. EVs have far more scrutiny on them, Peter. Does that, oh, does no. that reassure you a bit? <laughs> I, I, I was reassured before. The question actually was given to me by a major battery manufacturer. And I think probably the message they were wanting to get across was the uptake, uh, uptake sorry, of more gigafactories in a localised region by assessing the cost of having to move or the footprint to move from afar. It's it's not the the this sort of question. Um, I, I would like us to be to be all electric and greener much much quicker. But the person mentioned, should we not have a scorecard virtually where you can you you look at the vehicle, but you also have brought into effect um, a little bit like the white goods aspect, I suppose, how much actually of, a, of a, a carbon hit there has been in getting them there? 
because let's face it, when we do have the Gigafactory, or I don't think British Vault want to call it that particularly, they, they call it something else really. Um, but then we're going to have a lot of movement for, for UK production that's actually coming from wherever it actually comes from. Yeah, which is obviously much closer than lots of elements coming from China, for example. Um, so that was really where where the, the, the question originated, um, because we are all aiming for a, a, a totally zero approach, rightly so. Um, I think for, from an EV perspective and, and battery, I, I think one of the biggest questions for me is more the charging infrastructure in order to be able to cope with it. And especially in the UK, given the fact that households, there are a lot that do not have either a driveway or, or, or a garage or whatever to put it in. Um, so I think that's that's something that um, we should look to assess more. Uh, I don't think it's the number of charging points that we have in any one location. It's more the ability to charge quickly. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I've mentioned this before. We, we had an Audi e-tron on test. Yeah, no, no, I don't have an electric car yet, but I said yeah. Uh, but um, when we had to select a slower charging point locally, in an hour and a half, it successfully put 12 miles on range. So, mm -hmm. so to me, that's an area that we have to we have to look at. Um, do from a battery perspective, do do we sort of on a, on a retail car, people who definitely don't need the range at all, because statistically, or, or, or sort of people can monitor what they've had before given their own usage. But do we have different battery choices more? Do, do we go, in, in the case of fleet, do we, do we have smaller battery packs if the truck or large largest commercial vehicle is only doing localized trips? Do they, do they need to spend on a, a X ton battery? and lose payload when they might not. Um, I think it's always important. Uh, obviously, we, we look at lots of different applications, and very, very varied, and is understanding exactly those things, you know, how how much energy is needed. I think if you're always sizing for worst case, then you, you often end up putting extra cost in. Uh, consumers and consumers tend to be quite inflexible, though, quite intolerant of not being able to do what they could do before. But, you know, this is a period of um, dis huge global disruption, isn't it, and, and adaption. So um, I think it's interesting. I, I do think there are different models. I mean, my own, well, I'm sport slightly in uh, my EV use because I have access to home charging and slow charging and fast charging. So I, I rarely think about charging, but um, I, I understand I'm, I'm privileged because of that. But um, as a result of that ease of use, I've done you know, many tens of thousands of miles of pure EV driving. Um, but I accept it's a challenge when I push the boundaries and you want to go further, then access to fast charging is essential. But for most people, most of the time, uh, you know, standard or, you know, overnight charge or charge in a, a works car park or something is sufficient. And then something quicker for, for longer journeys normally does the job. But as soon as you start looking at the very outliers, then you start to drive in batteries far bigger than they need to be for most of what they do. I think there was a study we were involved in quite some time ago. Uh, one, of, one of the um, Innovate supported projects, actually. And I think it demonstrated that, you know, the average um, total mileage in, the, in, in our region was less, less than 20 miles a day easily. So pe people with not a particularly big battery wouldn't have to charge for several days. But the perception was, of course, they were driving a lot further. So you can't tell someone uh that, that they don't need it uh because it just acts as a barrier to people entering into the market so yeah it, it is definitely a challenge and it's not it's not fully resolved yet and we see that at extremes when we're, when we're talking to to our different customers doing different things you know uh, you know that, for example the compact excavator there was a lot of reluctance initially because people didn't believe it was going to be able to do what the diesel one did and it and it and it performed extremely well uh, and and the uh, there was some reviews done uh, by by some of the publications, and they were so impressed with it that they, they said they would take it hands down over the diesel version. So you got to put this technology into people's hands for them to try it. I always say, you know, these products don't stand, you know, 
first contact with uh, with the consumer, then they end up doing something completely different than you're expecting. So hence the importance of you know early stage trials and uh, and actually getting these products in people's hands to try it out. Peter, just um, just to flip it, really, I guess we're engineers on the whole on the call, um, and actually it's quite exciting, right? What Pete, Stephen just said there was we have to understand the problem better. Um, and so next week we're launching an innovation network for cross-sector battery systems. And that is getting the people who are really thinking about this together. So Stephen's one, we have um, a company in the UK called Arrival that's that's going through probably similar growth to Stephen and they're making modular uh, batteries um, for, for light goods vehicles and buses and vans. So you've got some really exciting things going on. The critical bit here is about how you understand it and how you translate it into products that get to market. Um, and are really appreciated by consumers. And I think that's what you're sort of hearing. Yes. I wonder, yeah. Akim, is, is, is your company moving towards uh, electrified vehicles? Um, you know, we are an asset light carrier. We are the largest sea freight company in the world. We moved 5 million containers last year, but we don't own any ships. And we're the second largest air freight carrier in the world. We don't own any aircrafts. And likewise, we are very strong in overland transportation in many parts of the world, but we don't own any trucks or very, very few. So those which you see with our branding, they are then subcontracted to somebody else. So therefore, uh, the question which we have to ask ourselves is that at our multiple locations, we are in 1,300 locations worldwide, we do receive electric trucks now, and we also need to provide charging infrastructure at those locations where we load or unload trucks. So that's one question, which is part of our global EV strategy uh, or net zero carbon strategy. And, and also we need to ask ourselves a question for our, for our workforce. Uh, in sales alone, we have 4,000 people working in sales in Kuhnenagel. Many of them drive company cars. And of course, not all of them have electric vehicles. Uh, but is this going to be the future? Uh, it, it's a very complex topic, but our company is already net zero carbon for our own emissions. And uh, we put out a very bold statement in the industry that by 2030, all our supply chains, also from our subcontract, just will be uh, completely decarbonized. Um, and that is only to be achieved through collaboration. So also you asked me earlier, how can we drive down costs and optimize things through collaboration. The industry is now much more open to collaborate with each other compared to in the past. Everybody wanted to do it on its own. We all know that if we develop it on our own, it will take too long. And by the time you get to market, you are outdated. So there is a big requirement to cooperate and to collaborate within boundaries, obviously, and there are laws and regulations, uh, but collaboration is key. So therefore, to answer your question, it's not applicable to us because we don't really have any assets, you know, which we which we control. However, for those of you here on the call interested in learning more about our sustainability ambitions at our EV booths, okay, download the net zero carbon flyer and also the CAN battery chain flyer where you can learn more about our battery logistics and our activities in decarbonizing global supply chains. I think you've just beautifully summed up uh, some of the specifications that customers are requiring, so that's perfect. Yeah, for all our new customers, uh, customers working for us in our new mobility area, we by default um, offset the emissions and they also get a certificate at the end of the year for the tons or kilograms of uh, CO2 produced during transport of their goods in order to help them to improve uses as a benchmark to avoid and to reduce footprint in the future. We've touched briefly on end of life battery. Um, how much uh, second life are we likely to be able to get from a battery before it has to be recycled? So I think Akim sort of asked, uh, answered a bit of this. So, um, I, you know, we, we have warranties on passenger cars for eight years, but I think actually in use they can go much further. And so I think that that's one of the unknowns when you do a step change like that. You know, you, you warranty for eight years, but actually... If the product goes on for 15 or 20, then then consumers will will use it, right? Or sell it and have it. We'll have a second second hand. Um, it's a big question mark. We've sponsored um, a couple of projects, Peter, in Second Life, um, and it's really exciting to see some of the things that they're getting used for. Um, and I think all Second Life batteries right now have a market and have a value. Um, 
I've, I've just just written an article actually um, uh, because Warwick Manufacturing Group, which is part of Warwick University, have just published a report on on the on the value at the end of life. Um, I think we'll get some opportunities. The, the thing you've got to remember, though, I think if you take a, a propulsion battery, a traction battery off um, out of a vehicle, uh, the materials uh, in, entrained in it are incredibly valued. And, and so there's not a, just a, oh, we'll take it out of there and put it into static storage because actually the business model, the value, the cost of that may not be quite right. So there's lots of work to be done. Perfect. As we, we, we sort of were over time, really, um, what would be um, individually uh, you would want people to take away from this uh, session? What would be a key takeaway for you to give? Maybe I can give it a start here. My key takeaway is for all of you guys uh, who have to storage or transport batteries, it is complicated. There's a price tag associated to it, uh, which may look a little ugly compared to moving other uh, CKD material to the assembly line. However, there's a reason to it because life is at risk and there's a potential threat of paying significant penalties than violating regulations, which are manifold in the transportation industry. So therefore, um, make sure that you're selecting the right partner who really has a track record and dedicated personnel to move this stuff around to avoid getting you into trouble. Thank you. So I was going to say it's the collaboration point for me. Um, we have a competition opening next Monday um, that Steve spoke about being Innovate UK Money. So if you're interested in that, do come along to that briefing. Even if you're in a related field or a, you might be somewhere where you might be a bit left field, come and meet people, come and listen to what's going on um, and come and sort of explore the area. Um, and then it's it's collaboration over the real technical nuances that are going on that's really key for competitive um, and you can come to a briefing on the innovation network launch as well to find out more Stephen I'd like to say um, we've obviously been in a period of disruption uh, predating the, the last six months it's it's hugely disruptive but that that uh, represents opportunity especially for innovative uh, companies um, for us electrification has been a massive opportunity and we see an almost limitless um, market that could be accessible to companies that have got the, the technological and, and manufacturing solutions. So for us, it's a really exciting period. Um, so, yeah, I'd encourage people to, to kind of exploit that disruption. Thank you. Thank you all for your value, valuable time. And um, keep safe and ho hopefully we'll catch again in the future and at some stage probably meet without a screen in between us so take care thank you thank you thank all. you thank Bye. you Bye. thank Bye. you Bye. Bye.